was my biggest hurdle. Myself, my internal insecurities. You're not good enough, or this is stupid, or whatever. That was my biggest problem, was like me talking down to myself, and that was just something that I had, you know, and I still kind of deal with imposter syndrome a little bit, but when I look back, and I look at the things that I've accomplished, really coming from nothing to where I am now, it's like, no, you, you did do that. I always had dreams and goals and hopes for myself and I always saw myself at um, you know a particular level and a lot of times people didn't see that so I had to prove myself in a lot of ways. I was born in Quincy, Illinois which is a really small town and it was me and my mom and my sister and then we moved to a little bit bigger city which is Springfield, Illinois and I spent the majority of my youth there. There wasn't a lot of creativity there. There weren't a lot of options there. But my mom would always take us to St. Louis or to Chicago, and that's where we would shop, and you know, we'd go to museums, and we'd just like really get to experience the big city, and um, that always kind of stuck with me. I grew up in the 90s, and I feel like that's where I got a lot of my influences from. Just watching Nelly and Aaliyah and Missy and just like coming up in that era, I still reference that a lot to this day because it just has like a very special piece in my heart. I was always into beauty and skincare. My mom was very glamorous, very beautiful woman. My sister was also so beautiful. It was a lot of uh, fun, a lot of experimenting. Um, I feel like beauty, you know, doing beauty yourself was very a, a very new concept. I remember having butterfly hair clips and like going to Limited 2 and getting the glitter eye gel and, you know, lipsticks from Walgreens. And, you know, it was always something I experimented with and I had a passion for. And I didn't come from money. I didn't, um, I didn't have a, a lot of the opportunities that um, a lot of people have. But that's okay, that's what made me who I am. That's what drove me. I was raised by a single mother. She worked really hard and we always saw that. I remember on Instagram once I posted a picture of me and my horse when I was little. And I had a few comments like, oh, we didn't know you came from money. And I'm just like, oh, you guys only knew. Like I literally used to shovel stalls and clean stalls and groom horses to pay for my lessons. My mom ended up acquiring her own business. Me and my sister both worked there, you know, when we were younger and I always had a job because there were things that I wanted and there were things that I wanted to do and I didn't have anybody I could call to like send me some money or buy me a plane ticket. So I just had to like get up and do it myself. When I look back, I didn't have a plan. My sister was the first person in our family on both sides to go to college. She's a lawyer now. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and I also didn't have the money to just sit around and, you know, try to experiment. Um, so me and my friend actually decided that we were gonna move to LA and we were gonna, you know, be actresses. I moved to LA with $250 and one suitcase. When things would arise, I would, you know, I would think about like, oh, is this something I want to do? Does this fit for me? And, you know, if it didn't, I would pass. And if it did, I would do it. I was 19 and I didn't know anything about starting a business. I didn't really have ideas. Um, and I was just, I was just trying to make ends meet. I was just trying to survive. So it really hadn't even crossed my mind at that point. Um, it was like working day to day and paying the rent and paying the bills. And, you know, I didn't even have a car. I used to take the bus or I used to skateboard to work. I waitressed for a little bit. I actually worked at the Hooters on um, Hollywood Boulevard and um, just kind of like worked my way up. I started meeting people. I started making connections. Then I got a job modeling for American Apparel. And then it just kind of 
you know, spiraled from there. I was young, so it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Like, I don't know if I could do that now. Um, but back then, it was just that like natural driven need to want to succeed um, that kept me going. The hardest part about starting a business is starting the business. It's like when I started, I did not have it figured out. I Love Kadia was my first solo business. I always loved jewelry, just as, you know, it's a part of fashion and I'm very passionate about. And that taught me a lot. I still, you know, it didn't work out. And I just wasn't at a place in my life where I could continue to do it. But I'm very thankful for that experience because I learned so much and I was able to connect with so many people. That's how I met all the editors. That's how I met like a lot of my friends in the industry was, you know, trying to present and sell my jewelry line. What I quickly learned is that you need a lot of money to support a fine jewelry line. And um, there were there were many people that supported me genuinely. I got, you know, quite a bit of press. I remember meeting with Sarah from Colette. Colette is iconic and her taking like an unknown brand and putting it in her display case, that was, that was major. I always think back to that moment because it really just takes one person to believe in you. And you know, because I got that Colette stamp, I was able to get Barneys and I was able to get Browns and it was a great learning experience. I knew from my experience with Kadia that the next business that I do, I want it to be accessible to people. I want the girls that follow me to be able to afford what I'm presenting to them. That was very important to me. So I really did like a 180 because I had like the fine jewelry that was thousands of dollars. And then I went to, you know, the beauty line, which is $5 a mask. One time, my boyfriend at the time, he had bought me this brand called Kanebo, which is like a Japanese uh, skincare brand, double cleansing, double moisturizing. And that was the first time I ever really owned a luxury beauty product. And I just felt how different my skin felt. And it was like an eye opener for me. Later in my life, I started experimenting with products and posting it on Instagram. And I wasn't doing it for a reason. I was just doing it to share my experience and connect with you know other skincare enthusiasts. And people seemed to really love it. I don't know what it was about like my videos or or whatnot, but like people seem to really love it. And from the Kadia brand and press days, I had met this girl named Danielle Prescott and we became cool. She said, um, hey, I'm leaving L. I'm going to another, you know, publication, but I want you to meet our new beauty editor, um, Julie. And I met with Julie and she gave me a column where I could do like a monthly kind of blurb about, you know, what kind of skincare I'm into, what techniques I'm into, treatments, etc. And that was like really, really cool because with that, I was able to reach out to brands and to clinics and, and things like that. And I was able to get free treatments and free products. And then so in turn, I was able to post a lot more and share a lot more. And, you know, with that, I remember like, that's how I met Barbara Sturm, who's actually like one of my mentors. And, you know, I just, I just met so many people from having that column. And then I also feel like I built an audience on Instagram from that column because, you know, they were interested in skincare just like I was. And then it was so serendipitous when I launched my beauty brand because I had all of these like skincare followers already. I was never really thinking of it in a sense of how can I make a brand of like what doesn't exist. It, it, it really didn't come across um, in my mind until I went to Tokyo on a trip with Dior and I was in the aisles of Don Quixote because they have like the coolest beauty products in Tokyo. And I saw a lip mask there and I was like, wow, this is so cool. Especially coming from the Midwest, like my lips would get so dry and cracked. It was a, chron a chronic problem for me. 
So I got the lip mask, tried it, loved it. And then I, you know, ended up doing some research and, you know, there was just so many chemicals in it. And I was like, oh, I'm not really like into putting all those chemicals on my lips. So I looked for a natural alternative and there wasn't one. And that's why I was like, oh, that's interesting. And um, there was definitely a lot of like hesitancy on my part and a lot of insecurity. Like, is this dumb? Like, are people gonna like this? Like, you know, I don't know. And that's why it's so important to have a really strong support system around you because my husband, my friends, my loved ones, they all loved my idea and supported it and encouraged me to follow that. And I don't know that I would have done that without that support. I didn't have anybody telling me like, this is a stupid idea or you should just quit. And you know, if I did, I would probably be looking at them like, why would you be, you know, like, why don't you believe in me? I didn't know anything about the beauty industry in the terms of the business side. I didn't know where to go to create a product. I didn't know who to talk to about packaging or fulfillment or anything like that. So I just started doing research on Google and I found a manufacturer of the lip mask and um, I contacted them about doing a, a natural version and they said no. So then I found another manufacturer and they also said no. And then the third time's a charm, I found uh, a place and they said yes. And I've been working with them ever since because it's very important to have, you know, partners that, that respect your ideas and will help you bring those to life. So yeah, I tested a few formulas and, you know, back then I didn't have an R&D team. So it was me and my girlfriends. And finally I got, the right formula and then I worked with actually Louis de Guzman who is an RSVP alum. He made the first KNC Beauty logo and graphics for the lip mask and then I just you know that's when the ball got rolling and I had a little launch party and then I had you know people notice me like Cassandra Gray who also became one of my mentors and put KNC Beauty on the shelves in Violet Gray next to La Mer and, you know, Shanti Kai. It just takes, you know, one person to believe in you and your whole life can change. Even though at that time, you know, there was still a lot of no's that I was getting. I couldn't get press back then. I couldn't, you know, like, there was a, Sephora didn't reach out to me until like last year. It was just, you know, constantly being overlooked in the beauty industry and always seeing white women with blonde hair and blue eyes and people that I couldn't relate to. I just, I just never want people to feel like alienated by my brand, I guess. It is for everyone. It's for guys, it's for girls, it's for kids, it's for elderly, you know? And I just, I wanted to really convey that through my messaging. It was a lot of no's, but when I look back, there were so many major yeses that the no's didn't, they don't even matter. I don't even think about them anymore. The Star Eye Mask was a very special project. I knew that I had to get people to post about this eye mask and it's like, an eye mask, that's such a redundant thing, you know? So of course I wanted the ingredients to like really work. And then I wanted the packaging to be super cute. And then I had an idea of making the eye mask a unique shape. And that was something that had never been in the market before. It was always like the crescent, you know, half moon shape. And it took about a year to get this shape right. And Going back to Kadia, I did a collection on emojis. I love emojis. So I went looking through my phone, and I'm like, what emoji would be good for an eye mask? And that's where I came up with the shooting star. Besides sales, obviously the reception. And you know, when I look at KNC Beauty tags, it's mostly that eye mask. And then last year we won the Allure Best of 2020 Best Eye Mask, which is like, and I literally started crying and I was just like, oh my God, like it was just, it was like one of the best moments of my like professional career because I just never thought to be included with like these huge major billion dollar companies. I love Chanel and it was this, I still have it of course, it's this heart shaped bag and I remember seeing it in a magazine in the 90s and it's got a like gold link handle and the big CC on the heart and 
I remember like, I wanted this bag so bad, but it was like $5,000 and I was just, it was just not even attainable to me at all. And um, when I launched my eye mask, I saw that bag at what goes around comes around and I bought it for myself as a gift. And it was just like a really kind of like full circle, really amazing moment. I just did the KNC School of Beauty, our fourth session, and the girls are so young. They're like 19, we had a 16 year old on there, 19 year old, 20 years old. I'm like, you guys are already on the right path because you're educating yourselves, first of all. Secondly, like, you are gonna have to get scrappy. Like, you're gonna have to make those connections, go put yourself out there. Like, you've got to, you've got to put yourself out there. Um, you've got to work hard, unless your last name is, you know, something super famous or like your dad's got a lot of money or whatever, like you're going to have to work. I've mentored quite a few young ladies um, throughout my career, especially with KNC Beauty. And basically like when the Black Lives Matter movement was happening, I'm sitting in my house and I'm seeing all of the terrible things happening and, you know, engaging in all the conversations. And I'm really thinking to myself, like, what can I do to help? So the initial idea was to have a mentoring program that was, you know, centered on black women founders because there are so few of us. And I do think that we have a special set of hurdles that we have to go through even more than, you know, the average woman. I wanted the ladies to get something out of it, you know, so I definitely wanted to have like a, a, a grant prize. And um, at the time, you know, I was working with Revlon a lot and I had my agents reach out to them and they loved the idea and it just kind of snowballed. Every session that we do, it gets harder to find speakers because that's how few black female founders that we have. So. That's exactly why I created this School of Beauty was to like uplift my community and you know, people that look like me and girls that follow me and I always feel like knowledge should be free, school should be free. Me sharing my experiences and my keys to success is not going to hinder my success. It is going to help other people and I always believe like what you give out, you get back. And so like me being stingy with with connects or ideas or, or knowledge, like that's just, that's not gonna help anybody. And also like, because I've been successful, like I know how hard it was to get here. I know all the crap that goes on behind the scenes and like, I don't wanna be that person. Like I don't wanna be a hater, you know? Like I want people to be like, oh, she did this for me or she helped me this way. That is like part of my duty as being a successful black woman is to pay it forward and to put other people on. I feel super flattered to think that people think that I, you know, help change the beauty industry. It was never my intention to come in and disrupt. It was just like, hey, this isn't cool and this isn't right and like, let's do this instead, you know? And I think I think it was like the cultural shift of like everybody. The consumers are sick of seeing perfect people and like, you know, they're just, they're sick of just seeing a name of a brand and not the founder behind it or the face behind it. And like, they wanna see what the founder's doing. They wanna know where their money is, is going. So I think the consumer is really the, um, the people that are responsible for the change. I just happen to be, you know, kind of on that wavelength um, and thinking the same way because I was a consumer as well. I want to work smarter, not harder. I feel like the days of like the hustling and the constant grinding, like I, I, I can't do that anymore. Like I, and that's okay. Like I put in my time, you know, um, all throughout my twenties, I feel like I put in my time. I'm thinking about the keys and like what I've learned over the past like 10, 15 years and like how I can put that into play to make my life a little easier and to be able to, you know, have that balance at home with my kids and my husband. It was hard because when you see 
your parents struggle when you're younger, you, it gives you a drive that you don't want to live that life and you want better for your children. But now I'm like, dang, are my kids too spoiled now? It's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like sometimes they act like brats. And I just, I'm trying to find that balance of, you know, I still want them to have that work ethic. I still want them to know their roots, but I also, you know, want to, the reason why we work hard is to provide them a better life. So it's, it's just funny, you know, how it works out. I just really want my kids to be grounded and I want them to know and understand where they came from and how lucky and blessed they are. It's literally been from 19 years old to now 35 years old. It's been 16 years of just working and doing and hustling and I feel like now I'm kind of at a point where I can chill a little bit but then I also don't want to chill because there's so many other things that I still want to accomplish. So I'm really really into interior design and decor and furniture and you know art and stuff like that. I think that might be my next career foray and you know maybe in my 40s and I'm not stuck to anything. I think that like the failure of my first business taught me that you can't really be married to anything. I want to have more careers after this. Like, I want to have more businesses after this. Like, it's fun to me now because I kind of know the recipe. I want to continue to, you know, make waves and, and knock down doors and, like, you know, being the first black woman to host Complex Con. I want to do more things that I thought I would never be able to do and I wanna pave the way for women like me and continue to just educate and uplift and literally everything that I'm doing now, I wanna keep doing just amplified.